Hello, this is Dr. Arjun here. In today's video, I'll be teaching you how to read a CT PNS in simple steps. So, when a surgeon orders a CT scan before operating a patient on a sinus surgery or a skull based surgery, it is very important for the surgeon to know the basic anatomy of the sinus structures and the landmarks around it so that he does not have any complicated surgery. So there are a few principles when you order a CT scan before your surgery such as the thickness of the CT scan. Always make sure that the thickness of the CT scan should be in a range of between 0.6 mm to 2 mm max to 2 mm. If it is beyond 2 mm it is quite possible that certain neurovascular structures could get could be missed by the surgeon while reading the CT scan. So, so, so for example, in case of anterior ethmoidal artery, which is a, a diameter of 0.8 to 0.9 mm, if he gets a scan which is about more than 2 to 3 mm, he could miss reading that on the CT scan. And if he's operating on the ethmoid sinus region, high up in the skull base region, he could end up damaging it without knowing the exact level of the anterior ethmoidal artery in relation to the skull base. So the thickness plays a very important role in reading the CT scan. I personally recommend if possible to get a 1mm scan for all the patients. If possible to have even a better one it is 0.6mm. If not then 1mm should be good. The second thing is the sections where you ask the radiologist to provide you all the three scans the axial the sagittal and the coronal scans 0.6 to 1 mm so that you can study the anatomy of the sinuses from all the sides like a 360 degree view like a 3d anatomy so certain anatomy of the sinuses is well studied in case of sagittal scans for example the frontal sinus and the frontal recess anatomy is well studied in case of uh, the sagittal scans but in certain anatomy is well understood in the axial scans for example the uh, scans for the uh, the optic nerve the anatomy of the orbit the anatomy of the lamina papyracea is well studied in the axial scans so this uh, coronal scan if you ask why this is more important because when the surgeon is operating on a patient endoscopically, he is operating in a coronal view. So first, the basic anatomy to be understood is to be understood on a coronal section uh, as the surgeon will be operating in a coronal view on the patient. So the CT scan acts as a road map basically to the surgeon to approach uh, the various uh, sinus and the various neurovascular anatomy surrounding it. So whenever you have a scan, say this, I have a 0.6 mm scan with me and uh, to begin with I have a scan of, the entire scan is of a coronal section so I aim to clear the basics of how to read a coronal scan first and then in future videos, the next videos I'll be showing how to read a sagittal and an axial scan in detail and individually for the frontal and the orbital anatomy as well. So in this video I basically aim for the coronal view basics. So whenever you get a CT scan, uh, it is not in this scan though, uh, the first box always belongs to a scout region. It is also called as a scout view where the patient's head is visualized and all the cut sections are seen at particular interval of time this represents the thickness of the scans the thickness of the, in the interval represents the thickness at what interval the scans the sections have been taken so right next to the scout image is the very first image uh, you can see in this first image now this is a coronal view so as we all know the coronal view as we are going from, as we are going, this is the first image, as we are going behind, so we are following this image and as we are going behind, uh, we are going from anterior to the posterior point. So 
this first image basically represents the anterior most uh, region of the face and uh, as we go behind the last image represents the posterior most or you can say the anterior the posterior most region of the anterior and middle cranial fossa region so to begin with i'll start with this region as you all can see this is the area of the frontal bone now the bone on the ct scan appears as bright white so this area is the area of the frontal bone and within the frontal bone you can see these two pneumatized areas now air on ct scan appears as black so wherever you see black it is air so this is air as it is black so this is the interfrontal sinus septa and uh, this is the right sinus this is the left sinus the left frontal sinus so basically the left frontal sinus is completely clear and completely in view though the right frontal sinus is not well pneumatized in the most anterior aspect so frontal bone interfrontal sinus septa right frontal sinus and the left frontal sinus as we go below in the same scan you see these two elongated processes these are called as the fronto nasal process of maxilla this is the nasal bone you can see with the inter bony suture area so we present in the two nasal bony structures and arising from them laterally is the fronto nasal process of the maxilla this structure in between the vertical structure as you can see is the nasal septum the cartilaginous part and you can see here a small segment of the bone you can see here that represents the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid in the most superior aspect so this is the cartilaginous part of the septum and this is the uh, bony part of the septum that is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoids and you can see here below is the small uh, bony area this is called as the anterior nasal spine uh, the area of the maxillary crest of the maxilla the attachment to the nasal septum so as we move to the second scan you can see the transition happening this is a right frontal left frontal sinus the sinus size has increased it is bigger in this scan as compared to the first scan and this area you can see this was this area was deficient now this area is covered by the bone so now this area is the nasal bone if you see clearly you can see the interbony suture area well you can see this is the nasal bony area this is the right frontal left frontal interfrontal sinus septa see how clear the interfrontal sinus septa is it is now right and left so between the two sinuses it is called as the inter so the interfrontal sinus septa and as you can see this is a nasal bone this is a nasal bone this is the area of the frontal beak this is the area of the nasal bone this is a perpendicular plate of the ethmoid becoming elongated so as you can compare on the first scan this is the area of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and which is elongated in this scan a bit of right side deviation high level deviation you can see this is the frontal nasal process of the maxilla this is a septal cartilage this is a nasal spine the attachment of the maxillary crest to the nasal septum so as we move further ahead uh, should i say i if you are moving posteriorly see as compared to the second scan the third scan is showing even bigger frontal sinuses so these two frontal sinuses are even bigger as compared so as you going posteriorly the frontal sinus size increases you can see the nasal bone area here in between the frontal beak area this is a perpendicular plate of ethmoid becoming even more prominent the fronto nasal process of the maxillary bone this is the nasal septal cartilage this is a even for the more prominent nasal spine that is a this is not the nasal spine anymore because it was most anteriorly this is the area of the maxillary crest attached to the uh, cartilaginous part of the septum over here as we go posteriorly as you can see as I, i'll give you a superior view of this 
So as you can see in the first scan, the frontal sinus is increasing in size all throughout the way. So this is uh, the frontal sinus right and the left with intra sinus septa. You can see this. This is typical of a sinus. So as I have mentioned in the previous video while operating FES, I have mentioned the difference between uh, a sinus wall and a cell wall. So when you see this intra sinus septa, these are thick and attached firmly to the sinus wall over here. So these are typical of a sinus, mostly seen in frontal region. So this is a right, this is a left, this is the interfrontal sinus septa, this is the intra sinus septa, which is incomplete, not complete, it is incomplete. And as you go, see, this is now the nasal bone has disappeared. All you could see in all these three scans, you could see the nasal bone over here and the frontal beak above. So you see there is no nasal bone whatsoever here. Though there is a perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, the nasal septum, the nasal uh, maxillary crest, but there is no nasal bone here. So you are going posteriorly and nasal bone is anterior. So there is no nasal bone. Uh, but there is presence of full frontal beak over here as you can see this is the area of the frontal beak now what is frontal beak now frontal beak is a thick bony area which forms the anterior wall as well as the floor of the frontal sinus so you can see right you can see left you can see the right frontal beak you can see the in continuation the left frontal beak so this is a frontal beak area which forms the floor and the anterior wall of the frontal sinus and this is a perpendicular plate of the ethmoid the bony white region this is a cartilaginous part now the cartilage is not visible on the CT scan it appears to be as a soft tissue density it will not appear to be as a bony region so whatever this structure you can see this structure is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid this is the septal cartilage and again this is the maxillary crest of this is a maxillary bone this is a maxillary bone and what you see here this is the very most anterior aspect of the maxillary sinus this is the maxillary sinus in view now it is only on on the left side though but not on the right side so what i can assume by this is that this patient is tilted more towards the right side so that the left side becomes more prominent first and appears first as compared to the right side so this is a tilted patient, tilted scan, more towards the right side. So left maxilla, frontal beak, no nasal bone in this scan. As you go further behind, what you, you can see is the frontal sinus becoming even more prominent. Now, what a normal uh, scan, if you do not have much idea about the CT scans, and you're just following this scan from here to here and here and here and here and here this way see what common mistake what can what common mistake can happen is that now the frontal sinus when will you call it as a frontal sinus and when will you call it as a frontal recess the very important landmark is as i was saying the frontal beak now the importance of the frontal beak lies here now you can see this scan, the floor formed by the beak is intact. There is no gap, no dehiscence, no deficiency whatsoever. It is completely intact. This area is the frontal sinus area. Now as you go and see in this scan, you can clearly see this area of defect here. Yeah, I should not call it as a defect, but there is no frontal floor over here. So this now is the region of the frontal recess so this area here is the area of the frontal recess as you cannot see any frontal sinus floor over here so once the floor is not seen it becomes the frontal recess now as we all know the frontal sinus lies anterior to the frontal recess the frontal sinus as we go posterior posterior it drains into the frontal recess so this is the area where the point you see there is no floor anymore see how prominent the floor was here see that see it's not the case here 
this there is a gap over here so there is no floor anymore no frontal beak so this becomes a frontal recess so this is how you differentiate between a frontal recess and a frontal sinus one more important thing now you're just following this opening you're just following the uh, frontal sinus this is a frontal sinus you are still considering this as the frontal sinus see it is similar to a frontal sinus shape right this is still here this is a frontal sinus this is a frontal sinus but no that actually is not the frontal sinus frontal sinus was up till here only the moment the floor of the frontal sinus is not seen it becomes a frontal recess and once the frontal recess starts and still if you can see a area similarly looking as to a frontal sinus here is not the frontal sinus but the supra orbital cell okay this shaped like a frontal sinus it can confuse you with a it can mimic a frontal sinus but it is not a frontal sinus it is a supra orbital cell so this was a frontal recess area this was the frontal recess so on sagittal scan see this is where the sagittal scan is very important to know the anatomy in detail for the frontal recess anatomy so once the frontal recess starts there is no longer the frontal sinus we cannot call this what we have here as frontal sinus okay you cannot call this as frontal sinus or in some cases if the scan is about 2 mm or 3 mm or 1.6 1.5 then it could be this could be the posterior most aspect of the frontal sinus okay so this in this scan this could be the most posterior aspect of the frontal sinus and which drains through the frontal recess but beyond this as soon as the maxilla starts appearing and becomes prominent you are going posteriorly and see the frontal recess area is also not visible this was the frontal recess this was this was the front frontal recess so this is the posterior most aspect of the frontal sinus area and uh, which continues as the frontal recess inferiorly now as going more posteriorly you see this area is the area of the frontal recess which is coming into picture even more clear there are few cells lying in the area of the frontal recess so so if you, uh, you keep following the frontal sinus you enter the area of the frontal recess now the frontal recess as we all know is bounded anteriorly by the agarnese cell and posteriorly by the bulla ethmoralis so if you follow the frontal sinus the most posterior aspect and you get the frontal recess keep on following the frontal recess area this is the frontal recess area okay so this is the most posterior aspect of the frontal recess now beyond this the frontal recess you cannot see this is the anterior ethmoids so as this is the crista gelae which has started which is big which marks the beginning of the anterior cribriform so this area in the frontal recess is showing few cells now i'll just clear up what cells they are so we all know in basic anteriorly the agarnesi posteriorly the bulla ethmoidalis now you follow the frontal sinus the frontal recess now this is the most posterior aspect of the frontal sinus and if you go further more posterior this frontal sinus look alike cell or structure is not the frontal sinus anymore this is a supra orbital cell which looks like frontal it mimics the frontal but actually it is a supra orbital cell see this is the orbit so above this is the supra orbital cell shaped like a frontal sinus so many students uh, many young surgeons get confused the, they just keep following the frontal sinus posteriorly without knowing that they have actually entered the area of the supraorbital cell or the supraorbital recess this area you can see over here is the area of the frontal recess so this area this is a frontal recess widening this is a frontal recess area uh, and in this step 
this scan the frontal recess is not there anymore that's the anterior ethmoids so the agar knees i sell which i as i said uh, anteriorly it is anterior to the frontal recess uh, so in this region uh, you have to search for the nasolacrimal duct here you can see this structure the vertical soft tissue shadow lodged within this bony segment that's the lacrimal bone and this area is the area of the nasolacrimal sac the lacrimal sac and the which continues as further below as the nasolacrimal duct uh, this is a sac area this is a duct area this is the inferior turbinate so this area this blackish area is the inferior meatus uh, the inferior uh, meatus lodges the opening of the nasolacrimal duct uh, this nasolacrimal duct opens into the inferior meatus at around 1.5 centimeters behind the anterior end of the inferior turbinate so you can see this is inferior meatus this is a nasolacrimal sac the duct which opens into the inferior meatus so this is a lacrimal bone and uh, this is the agar knees i sell so as i was saying the frontal recess is anteriorly bound by the agar knees i and agar knees i what what actually agar knees i is agar knees i is nothing but an anterior ethmoidal cell which pneumatizes the lacrimal bone so that is the agar knees i so if the agar knees i is too big or too pneumatized it can uh, it can uh, pneumatize the entire lacrimal bone so it is which becomes very necessary to open while performing a uh, endoscopic dcr dicrosisterhyostomy so this here this cell you can see here this is the area of the agar nasi which was visible in the previous scan as well so this is small structure you see this is the agar nasi so if you go posterior this becomes this is the agar nasi cell this is the agar nasi cell over here you see this this is the agar nasi cell over here and this is the inferior turbinate and this structure is the agar nasi uh and this is the frontal recess posterior to the agar nasi so if we go keep on going posteriorly you can see this this is the inferior turbinate this is the inferior turbinate this is the inferior turbinate bone inferior meatus now see in this scan the nasolacrimal duct is not seen it was seen clearly in this section on the left side the nasolacrimal duct on the right side so even in this scan it was not visible the agar nasi was just started to appear it just started to appear now this is the area of the agar nasi that's the area of the nasolacrimal duct system and you can see here again there is no evidence of any nasolacrimal duct system in this scan so whenever you see the nasolacrimal duct region nearby anterior to which should be the agar nasi so once you locate the agar nasi and keep on going posteriorly so this was the agar nasi here posterior to it opens the frontal recess and further more posterior if you go comes the bulla ethmoidalis see this is the inferior turbinate that structure which you see here going vertically up 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 like this see this inferior turbinate this structure going up like this here like up totally up and then getting attached to the lamina papyracea yes this structure is the uncinate process that structure is the uncinate process this is the horizontal portion of the uncinate process which is having a attachment to the inferior turbinate then this is a vertical process of the uncinate process which is going medial to the agar nasi this is the agar nasi cell region it is going medial to the agar nasi crossing vertically up and then turning laterally to have an attachment on the lamina papyracea so this is the most common scenario of the attachment of the vertical aspect of the uncinate process around 95 to 98% of the population they have this kind of attachment of the uncinate process now the uncinate process is the only mobile part in the lateral wall of the nose and the vertical process of the uncinate is highly variable most common variation being 
the uh, attachment to the lamina papyracea which I'll explain in detail after some time. So this is the uncinate process attached to the lamina papyracea. So this was the inferior turbinate. Uh, this is the area where the uncinate is being attached. So the main thing which you guys have to remember here is that the uncinate here goes first medial to the agar nasi cell area over here. See this area over here, this entire area belongs to the agar nasi. If you follow the scans, this is the beginning of the agar nasi cell. That's the area of the agar nasi. If you go on posteriorly, this is the area of the agar nasi. And you can see the uncinate process just beginning over here. If you keep following posteriorly, this is the uncinate process going medial to the agar nasi and then having an attachment lateral to the lamin papyracea. If you keep on following posteriorly, now you can see the proper uncinate process and what you see here is the bulla ethmoidalis. This is a region of the bulla ethmoidalis. So, this was the area between the agar nasi and the bulla ethmoidalis is the frontal recess. So, this uncinate process and this is the bulla ethmoidalis. Okay? All this structure which you see above here with the maxilla in view, this maxilla is in view, this is the supraorbital cell. Supraorbital cell when maxilla is in view. This was the posterior most limit of the frontal sinus beyond which you will not find the frontal sinus but you will find a structure like this if at all present. So that is called as a supraorbital cell which is ending or continuing into the frontal recess area. Now remember this, this point is very easy. It's, it's quite confusing sometimes but very easy to understand. This was the frontal sinus posterior limit. So beyond which there will be no sinus. And this is a frontal recess area. And that's the start of the agar nasi. You keep on going posteriorly, that's the agar nasi. The frontal recess area widening up. But this is a supraorbital cell now, which is draining into the frontal recess. So here was frontal sinus with the recess. Here it is the supraorbital cell with the recess. So this is the prominent agar nasi. That's the start of the uncinate process. Now as we keep going further posteriorly, you can see this uncinate process going medial to the agar nasi. This being the area of the frontal recess still. And this is the supraorbital cell and having the attachment on the lateral part to the lateral aspect that is on the lamina papyracea. So if you keep on going further posterior, you can see the beginning of the cribriform plate that is the crista gelli. As you can see here, that's the crista gelli with the cribriform uh, olfactory fossa. So here, the structure which you see here, the structure which you see here, that's the bulla ethmoidalis. The bulla ethmoidalis attaches laterally onto the lamina papyracea. As you can see here, that's the lamina of the orbit, that is the medial orbital wall, that's the lamina papyracea. The bulla ethmoidalis is attached to this lamina papyracea. So this was the entire area of the frontal recess. This was the area of the frontal recess, the frontal recess and this is the area of the supraorbital cell draining into the frontal recess and posteriorly into the supraorbital recess. So this is still the supraorbital cell, the, that's the crista gelli. See how posterior the supraorbital cell here is because of the excess pneumatization in the uh, sinus structures. The, this is the bulla ethmoidalis. So it is very important to understand where exactly the agar nasi cell starts and where the frontal recess exactly lies between the agar nasi anteriorly and the bulla ethmoidalis posteriorly. So that's the bulla ethmoidalis. Now, once we have no, once we have confirmed the presence of the agar nasi and the bulla ethmoidalis and the position of the uncinate process, it becomes very easy on the coronal sections to know the anatomy of the osteomeatal unit. Now, this is the uncinate you can see. That's the uncinate, the horizontal process. That's the vertical process. So, when you open up the maxilla during a fest sinus surgery, the first step 
which you do is the ansinotomy where you open up the ansinate the junction of the vertical and the horizontal lamella so this is a vertical lamella this is the horizontal lamella so this is a junction over here you take you take your backbiting forceps and break this junction okay and gain an entry into the two dimensional space called as the hiatus semilunaris inferioris which you can see which is right over here so that's the uncinate horizontal that's the uncinate vertical and this is the bulla et mordalis so as we all know the space between the bulla et mordalis and the uncinate is also called as the hiatus semilunaris inferioris see the space over here that's the hiatus semilunaris inferioris which is a two dimensional space which opens up into this area where i'm circling right now is the three dimensional space called as the infundibulum this narrow structure you see the narrow tube like structure wait a second i'll show you more clearly this narrow this narrow tube like structure you can see which is very narrow and slender that's the hiatus semilunaris inferioris which opens up into a more wider space you see this the area where i'm circling right now is called as the infundibulum now that infundibulum is a three dimensional space this was a two dimensional this was this is a three dimensional and this is the maxillary sinus proper so now having known the anatomy of the osteomyatal unit the osteomyatal complex it seems to be pretty normal in this patient as the drainage pathway is not blocked by any uh, edema or inflammation so it looks quite normal to me so this is the area where you have to look if a patient complains of uh, maxillary cheekbone tenderness and heaviness so whenever you palpate and the tenderness comes positive on the ct scan this is the area the osteomyatal unit which you have to look for whether it is blocked by the inflammatory edema and uh, it will show dense collections within the sinus which is a sign of ciliary stasis and secondary infection so going further more posteriorly you can see this area it keeps on widening and there are very numerous cells which are small in size and larger in number so that begins with the anterior ethmoidal cells this is a middle turbinate the see you no longer see the ancinate process okay because we are going posterior now this is we have entered into the anterior ethmoid so there is no ancinate as we could see the ancinate over here this is the ancinate this was the ancinate the ancinate is most prominent in this scan so it keeps on fading so this is the ancinate and see this uh, there is no ancinate at all here whatever part of the ancinate you see here this is the horizontal process of the ancinate the vertical process is disappeared so the horizontal process is like extends from anterior to posterior and sometimes attaches to the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone which becomes posterior attachment a few cases most common attachment being the inferior turbinate so that's the horizontal process of the ancinate and uh, that's the uh, bulla et modalis the anterior et modal cells numerous cells so that's the maxillary sinus and as it keep on going posteriorly you can see uh, a lot of anterior et modal cells coming into picture and uh, this is a middle turbinate going attachment to the lamina papyracea and one attachment going on the cribriform plate so this will officially mark the beginning of the uh, ground lamella which is a middle one third of turbinate which i'll explain you in some time so beyond this you go into the posterior ethmoids so so far we have understood the uh, relationship of the frontal sinus with the frontal recess and uh, how the supraorbital cell is in relation to the frontal recess and the frontal sinus posteriorly so the, so the supra or so if uh, if you are going through an axial section of the patient the most anterior cell in the frontal sinus region is the interfrontal sinus septal cell behind which you will find the frontal sinus opening behind which you will see the supra orbital cell opening so the supra orbital cell always lies posterior to the frontal sinus never anterior or never lateral to it it is always posterior to the frontal sinus 
so we dealt with the relationship of the frontal sinus with the recess and the supraorbital cell then we uh, well, then we studied the anatomy of the nasolacrimal duct system how the nasolacrimal duct starts and ends into the inferior meatus how to identify the nasolacrimal system on the coronal sections <coughs> we also studied in detail the relationship of the agar nasi cell the agar nasi cell the ansinet process the attachment of the ansinet here the uh, bulla ethmoidalis that's the bulla ethmoidalis beginning that's the bulla ethmoidalis the anterior ethmoids so this is all related to the osteomyoidal unit so this comes as a short note for the residents in your uh, semester exams the university exams so you have to be well thorough with the uh, anatomy of the osteomyoidal unit so yeah so basically we wind up uh, the maxillary the osteomyoidal unit the nasolacrimal duct system the agar nasi the bulla ethmoidalis the frontal recess the uh, lamina papyracea relation to the bulla ethmoidalis so now i like to teach you some points about the uh, ansinet process in detail the various parts and the anatomy of the ansinet process uh, so the ansinet process has this uh, inferiorly the horizontal portion as i said before so i was saying this was attached to the uh, this is the ansinet process this is a horizontal process of the ansinet uh, this ansinet is the horizontal process is attached to the inferior turbinate most commonly uh, it is a fixed uh, insertion uh, sometimes it gets inserted to the po posterior the perpendicular plate of the palatine posteriorly the vertical process as you can all see here this is the ansinet horizontal process uh, and this is the ansinet vertical process see this entire ansinet vertical process this is the now in case of 95 90 to 95 percent of patients the ansinet process the vertical part of the ansinet process as you can see here it attaches it goes medially around the agar nasi it goes medially around the agar nasi forming the medial wall of the agar nasi and turns lateral to attached to the lamina papyracea now you can clearly see here this is the horizontal portion that is the vertical portion so the vertical portion turns medially around the agar nasi forms the medial wall of the agar nasi and turns then laterally to attach to the lamina papyracea now what is this this is the lamina papyracea and this is the entire ansinet process this is the entire ansinet process okay this thing is the entire ansinet process here so this is the ansinet process uh, so the variable portion of the ansinet process is nothing but the vertical portion the horizontal portion is fixed so this is the uh, vertical portion attached to the lamin papyracea. This is a common variant. So now when the ansinet process is attached to the lamina papyracea, the frontal sinus or through the frontal recess drains into medial aspect into the middle meatus. Now this is the middle meatus region. This was the inferior meatus this is the middle meatus like this this is a septum in the midline okay and this is the right side this is the left side this is the middle turbinate i'll explain the middle turbinate in detail in some time so this is the middle turbinate lateral to it is the middle meatus this this area is the middle meatus so if the uncinet process is attached to the lamina papyracea the frontal sinus will drain into the middle meatus medially so if the ansinet is having a lateral attachment the drainage will be medial opposite sometimes this ansinet process attaches not to the lamina but in few cases to the skull base now you can see this is a skull base it is attached here like this directly up or sometimes it is attached to the middle turbinate directly here so it's either going to be here like this or here like this so in both the cases, the sinus will drain here into the infundibulum directly. So in that case, 
the maxillary sinus and the frontal sinus will have a common drainage output okay so if they get blocked they both get blocked so this is the concept of the uncinate process the osteomyital complex the maxillary sinus output drainage the frontal sinus drainage depending upon the uncinate process attachment whether it's lateral or medial in medial it could be cribriform or it could be the middle turbinate itself so this patient is having a lot of pneumatization that is why all the structures are pushed behind posteriorly because normally this is a maxillary sinus this is a maxillary sinus and this is the supraorbital cell this cannot be frontal sinus frontal sinus just posteriorly was here this is a frontal recess which ended here and this is the supraorbital cell supraorbital cell because of the excess pneumatization all the structures are pushed posteriorly okay so moving on to the middle turbinate now so we finished frontal sinus recess uh, the drainage the ostomyital unit the uncinate process attachments the agar nasi the bulla ethmodalis the ostomyital complex maxilla the lamina papyracea now we will come on the part of the middle turbinate now as we are following following we see we saw the earlier scans we could see only the inferior turbinate inferior turbinate but not the middle turbinate okay so in this very scan i'll just give you a better picture here in this scan you can see that on the left side this is a septum okay with a boggy uh, nasal septal cartilage so this is a septum see this structure arising see this structure arising from here yep that is the middle turbinate origin so as we go forward forward see this this is the middle turbinate this is the middle turbinate this is the middle turbinate as we go here this is the middle turbinate as we go here this is the middle turbinate just lateral to the septum this is the middle turbinate clearly seen now that's the middle turbinate okay as we go below you can see this is the middle turbinate with the concobulosa pneumatization this is the middle turbinate so the origin we saw we saw the origin of the middle turbinate that's the origin of the middle turbinate now to uh, be to, to speak in detail now what is middle turbinate middle turbinate uh, has three parts the anterior middle and posterior one thirds now the anterior one third uh, which is the most anterior aspect of the middle turbinate attaches itself as you can see uh, as you can see this is the anterior most part of the middle turbinate and this is the posterior most part of the frontal sinus so it attaches the middle turbinate the anterior one third attaches itself onto the junction of the medial and the lateral lamella of the cribriform plate so in this picture it will be very clear see this is the septum midline and uh, this is a cribriform plate this is a middle turbinate this is a middle turbinate this is the medial lamella see the gap the pinpoint gap in between this is a septum attached to skull base and this is a middle turbinate you see that thin white bony septa in between those two the small horizontal segment that's the medial lamella of the cribriform plate and you can see something vertical here that is the lateral lamella of the cribriform plate that is the most anterior aspect of the cribriform now as we all know that the cribriform starts posterior to the frontal sinus and never at the level of the frontal sinus so if the middle turbinate is attached at the level of cribriform plate this definitely cannot be frontal sinus at all and this is the anterior most aspect of the cribriform frontal sinus ended here itself because of the excess pneumatization the, all these sinuses are pushed posteriorly all these sinuses are pushed posteriorly so you can have a clear look medial lamella the lateral lamella the cribriform plate and this is the anterior one third of the middle turbinate as we move on forward as we keep on moving posteriorly see this middle turbinate the cribriform plate 
as we move on posteriorly see this is the very beginning of the this is a very beginning of the cribriform plate it, it is marked by the presence of the crista gilli now what is this diamond shaped this diamond shaped structure is known as crista gilli this is crista gilli and crista gilli marks the uh, beginning of the cribriform plate it is a part of the ethmoidal labyrinth which consists of the crista gilli the anterior ethmoidal the posterior ethmoidal the cribriform plate the olfactory uh, fenestrations so this is a septum in the midline corresponding to the crista gilli and this is a middle turbinate and as you can clearly see the thin medial lamella and the long vertical lateral lamella okay and to which the middle the turbinate ka anterior one third is attached as we go posteriorly we can see it is still attached to cribriform junction of medial and lateral lamella so this is still the anterior one third as you can still go posterior you can see still the attachment is same so this is still the anterior one third as you start to go even further more posterior see there are two attachments now see this is a middle turbinate this is a middle turbinate see this one attachment is going to the cribriform as you followed and this other attachment you can see is going laterally to the lamina papyracea you see that so this is what going to the lateral wall that is the medial wall of the orbit that is known as the lamina papyracea this attachment is called as the ground lamella which is also called as a middle one third of the middle turbinate this was the posterior most aspect of the anterior one third and now this is the beginning of the middle one third now the middle one third is attached to the lamina papyracea and this is also called as the ground lamella and we all know that ground lamella is a structure which separates the anterior ethmoid from the posterior ethmoids and as we go behind you can see this is a middle turbinate see this this is a middle turbinate inferior turbinate middle turbinate middle turbinate being attached to where the lamina papyracea this is a middle turbinate being attached to the lamina papyracea and this is still it is not though clear it is not the clear most uh, picture here because it is not clearly defined as the attachment to the lamina papyracea because i can see some attachment going here to the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone as well and where the third part of the middle turbinate attaches which is also called as a posterior one third of the middle turbinate attaches to the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone now this is the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone which is forming the medial wall of the posterior maxilla okay so majority of the attachment is going on to the perpendicular plate and a small part is going to the lamina papyracea so this signifies the most posterior or you can say the posterior ethmoid itself because it is majorly because it is majorly being attached to the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone so this is a posterior ethmoids and this is a posterior one third of the middle turbinate once you are in the posterior ethmoids as soon as you cross the ground lamella as i said this was the ground lamella and i think they have skipped few scans in between so they have directly given this and we are in the uh, attachment of the posterior one third of the middle turbinate as the as uh, the moment you are crossing the ground lamella and entering the posterior ethmoid because ground lamella is the uh, partition between the anterior ethmoid cells and the posterior ethmoid cells so once the ground lamella we have crossed here and we have entered the posterior one third of the middle turbinate it means that you have entered the posterior ethmoids you start seeing another structure called as superior turbinate you see this area on both sides you can see you see that i'll give you a close up you see this all the three turbinates in view inferior turbinate middle turbinate and superior turbinate that's the superior turbinate so all the three turbinates are in view once you enter the posterior ethmoids and this is the septum and this is the superior turbinate the superior turbinate the middle turbinate and the inferior turbinate so officially we have entered into the posterior ethmoidal cavity 
so this was basically the anatomy of the middle turbinate with the three different parts and the three different attachments on the basis of which you identify where exactly you are so see the importance of knowing the anatomy of the CT scan you know exactly where you are going so this was all about the middle turbinate now I will point you to the uh, olfactory cribriform area now as we all saw this was the area of the cribriform uh, that is the crystal gili this was the crystal gili area okay so the crystal gili is nothing but a bony projection like a diamond shape signifying the uh, beginning of the anterior ethmoidal cribriform anterior ethmoidal and the anterior cribriform area so basically what is the significance of this uh, cribriform uh, this uh, crystal gili and uh, the olfactory region now this is a crystal gili this was the cribriform plate over here this was the crystal gili okay this was the crystal gili this was the cribriform plate over here that's see this uh, vertical white thick structure you can see not thick but white structure vertical this is a middle turbinate as i said it was a the attachment of the anterior ethmoid the anterior one third being attached to the junction of the this vertical lateral lamella and a horizontal middle lamella now this vertical part you can see that's the lateral lamella also called as vertical lamella it is vertical and the medial lamella which is horizontal now at the junction of which the middle turbinate anterior one third attaches now the level or you can say the height or the length of the lateral lamella okay this is the lateral lamella the vertical level the height in relation to the uh, base of the cribriform the vertical length and the base here see that this is a base this is a skull base and this is the vertical level of the lamina lateral lamella depending on the depth of this okay depending on the depth of this uh, surgeon named as Kiros uh, gave a classification of the depth of the olfactory fossa this is the olfactory fossa also called as olfactory fossa in a, uh, carrying the olfactory nerves the fenestration the olfactory epithelium so this is the olfactory fossa now he classified it into three types type 1 type 2 and type 3 type 1 is in where the depth of the olfactory fossa is only about 1 to 3 mm so if this is a skull base the vertical lamella will be at this level only see this is at this level but in type 1 it will be on this level only so only a small margin and then the skull base will be at a much safer level type 2 is where the depth of the olfactory fossa is around 4 to 7 mm so a bit higher so i think in this scan it is about 4 to 7 mm in between so i think yeah this is curious type 2 I think this is a Kiro's type 2 classification. Yeah, this is Kiro's type 2 mostly. So, if in type 3, the length extends from 8 to 16 mm depth. So, the skull base will be here and the lateral lamella will be like this higher up, giving a long distance and making the lateral lamella so prone to injury that it will cause a CSF leak if not handled properly. So this is how the Kiros classification was done and depending on that Kiros classification the depth of the olfactory fossa is measured and uh, of which the type 2 is the most common and type 3 is the most dangerous for Kiros. So this was the significance of the olfactory fossa, the Krista Gilai and the Kiros classification. Uh, moving forward I would like uh, to bring your attention to yet another important neurovascular bundle area so that would be the uh, anterior ethmoidal artery so I was talking about the neurovascular bundle about the anterior ethmoidal artery and the anterior ethmoidal nerve uh, the anterior ethmoidal nerve being the continuation of the nasal ciliary nerve from the orbit so yeah to locate the anterior ethmoidal artery first we need to see the scan properly so this was the first scan we go from anterior to the posterior so we come from the anterior aspect to the posterior aspect now 
टू नो दी एनाटमी ऑफ द एंटीरियर एथमोइडल आर्टरी वी नीड टू नो दी एनाटमी ऑफ द ऑबिट द ऑबिटल एनाटमी इज़ अ वेरी हाई इम्पॉर्टेंस सो एज वी सी हेयर दिस इज़ अ वेरी इनिशियल पार्ट ऑफ द ऑबिट कमिंग टू पिक्चर सी देर वॉज नो ऑबिट अप एंटिल हेयर देर इज नो ऑर्बिट ओके सो दिस इज़ अ फर्स्ट स्कैन वेर दी ऑर्बिट इज़ कमिंग इन टू पिक्चर एज वी गो बिहाइंड दी ऑर्बिट इज़ बिकमिंग मोर प्रोमिनट ओके इट इज़ बिकमिंग मोर प्रोमिनट सो नाउ दिस इज दी ऑर्बिट दिस इज अ ग्लोब ऑफ दी ऑर्बिट दिस इज अ पेरी ऑर्बाइटा ओके दिस इज अ पेरी ऑर्बाइटा ग्लोब ऑफ दी ऑर्बिट दिस इज दी ऑर्बाइटल फैट रीजन एंड दिस बोही कवरिंग इज द लेमन पेपरेशिया immediately lateral to the lamina papyracea is the fat layer and lateral to the fat layer is the periorbita which is also a layer of fat so this is the orbit proper this is a globe so this is the entire orbital structure this is a medial wall of the orbit the roof of the orbit the floor of the orbit as we go forward this is a roof of the orbit this is a medial wall this is the floor of the orbit the floor of the orbit basically is nothing but the roof of the maxilla you see this this is the entire thing is the maxilla this is a medial wall of the maxilla lateral anterior lateral and the roof of maxilla so the roof of maxilla is the floor of the orbit this is the roof of the orbit this is the medial orbital wall also called as the lamina papyracea the name lamina papyracea is like papyracea it comes from paper thin so it's like very thin very prone to injury while opening the maxillary sinus so this is the orbital this is the orbit this is a bony orbit this is the uh, eye globe the eye ball this is the periorbita the fat layer and the lamina outside okay so as we go posteriorly uh, we see the orbital muscles coming into picture so to have a more prominent picture we have to go more posteriorly so as the uh, muscle attachment is to, towards the posterior aspect and not on the anterior aspect so see anteriorly you do not see any muscles attaching very faint shadow of the muscles but the prominency appears only posteriorly so we see this the prominence of the muscles appearing so basically this is the orbit uh, this is the roof of the orbit the medial wall the floor of the orbit the lateral wall this is the bony orbit now this is the muscle layer now uh, what we see here is the optic nerve in the between this is the optic nerve now uh, this is the optic nerve in the center this is the optic nerve in the center so yes we can see the optic nerve on the ct scan as well the axial section the coronal section the sagittal section yes we can see it so this is the optic nerve in the center here and these are the muscles on the periphery this is the this is the inferior uh, this is the inferior uh, rectus this is the superior rectus this is the medial rectus this is the lateral rectus this is this being this here you can see one more structure this is a superior oblique muscle so superior oblique and the medial rectus see this is the area of the muscles so now what is the significance why am i stressing so much on the uh, anatomy of the orbit because the anatomy of the orbit will help you to understand the origin and the exit of the anterior ethmoidal artery so it will be very easy for you to understand that in that terms so i'll consider the left side because the left side is more prominent as the patient is having a tilted scan so in this photo see this is the optic nerve this is the uh, inferior rectus medial rectus superior rectus lateral rectus and here this small shadow also this is a superior oblique so the first point now the anterior ethmoidal artery i'll just give you information about the anterior ethmoidal artery anterior ethmoidal artery basically by the way this is the anterior ethmoidal artery so anterior ethmoidal artery is a branch of the ophthalmic artery ophthalmic artery is in branch of the internal carotid artery so uh, the ophthalmic artery is given off uh, by the the 
anterior ethmoidal artery is given off by the ophthalmic artery uh, medially in the orbit uh, along the nasociliary nerve it travels in the orbit uh, in the orbit at the level uh, between this medial rectus this is the medial rectus and this is the superior oblique now so see as we were following the scans the muscles were not prominent anteriorly now this was the medial rectus here and superior rectus inferior rectus and no way in the picture it's a very faint very faint uh, image of the superior oblique here so as we go behind this is the superior oblique becoming more prominent this is a medial rectus but still there is a considerable amount of gap in between the two that is a medial rectus and the superior oblique see this this is the gap now as we go forward see this the gap is closing in the gap is closing in and the superior oblique and the medial rectus are coming close to each other okay so this is called as the confluence of the medial rectus with the superior oblique so at this very confluence you see this bony projection coming here in picture that bony projection is nothing but the exit of the anterior ethmoidal artery this is the exit of the anterior ethmoidal artery from the orbit into the nasal cavity and into the cranium so this is called as the kennedy nipple sign while repeat this is also called as the kennedy nipple sign because it is giving a nipple kind of a shape the nipple of a bottle which a baby has so that is kennedy nipple so this is a nipple shape uh, kennedy nipple sign and this is the anterior ethmoidal artery at this level so this is how this is one of the few points how you can identify the anterior ethmoidal artery this one being with the help of the orbital anatomy the muscle anatomy so that's the first point uh, there are three landmarks of identifying the anterior ethmoidal artery the first landmark being the ground lamella the most consistent landmark is the ground lamella now as we all know this was the middle turbinate having a uh, attachment to the cribriform that is the anterior one, one third and then here we could see the posterior one third attachment so there were two divisions here this one going to the uh, lamina that is the middle one third this is the entry so this is the beginning of the this is the beginning of the ground lamella this is the beginning of the ground lamella so this is in the uh, uh, ground lamella and here we cannot see the ground lamella at all so this is a proper posterior ethmoidal cavity and here also you can see a slight prominence of the artery in the orbit see this the nipple shape slight prominence is still there and this is the anterior one third of the uh, middle turbinate so we are anterior to the ground lamella so um, of all the surgeries and the um, skull base uh, dissection uh, over the years uh, studies have mentioned that the ground lamella is the most consistent feature uh, landmark for the identification of the anterior ethmoidal artery now the anterior ethmoidal artery runs in the skull base a few millimeters anterior to the ground lamella so see this was this was the ground lamella here and we are going anterior now i'm going i'm going to uh, i'm going to this side so this becomes anterior and this becomes posterior in relation so you see this this is a this is the ground lamella start and i'm going anterior to it see this the artery see this the artery so the artery is anterior in relation to the ground lamella always always remember that few millimeters anterior now this scan is a 0.6 mm scan so roughly you can count this as 0.6 and 0.6 so it is roughly around 1.2 so it's a 1 to 2 mm 1 to 2 mm anterior to the ground lamella so this is one consistent feature you can remember always while doing surgery as well the moment you see the ground lamella and the attachment of the ground lamella to the skull base just anterior to it few millimeters is the anterior ethmoidal artery just anterior to it is the anterior ethmoidal artery that's the beginning of the artery that's the beginning of the artery and uh, that's the uh, proper arterial canal so that was one point second point is the presence of the supraorbital cell uh, the supraorbital cell that is a supraorbital recess 
the supraorbital recess. Now, as we all, uh, I showed you that we had a supraorbital cell. Now, this was the most posterior part of the frontal sinus over here. This was the supraorbital cell. Supraorbital cell. You keep on following the supraorbital cell. See, still the supraorbital cell is in view. It has not finished. Still, there is supraorbital cell. The moment the supraorbital cell, which drains into the supraorbital recess, ends, the artery is immediately caudal to it. See this? This is the end of the. Re this is the beginning of the end of the supraorbital recess. And see here, it ends over here. See this? Artery is immediately caudal to it. The artery is immediately ca and caudal to it. So caudal as in posterior to it see so this is a second feature where you have to keep in mind if at all you encounter a supraorbital cell and a supraorbital recess it is always always in mostly uh, relation to the anterior ethmoidal artery the anterior ethmoidal artery will be immediately not even a few mm it will be immediately caudal to the end of the supraorbital recess so this is a supraorbital recess and you see immediately caudal that is posterior to the immediate end is the anterior ethmoidal artery this is the artery proper so always remember first was ground lamella few millimeters anterior to the ground lamella and here immediately posterior to the uh, supraorbital recess or the supraorbital cell yeah so it is anterior to the uh, ground lamella and immediately posterior to the supraorbital recess. The third feature uh, is, uh, as I know, the third feature is the uh, bulla ethmoralis. Now, as we all saw the bulla ethmoralis, now we followed the bulla ethmoralis. Now, we see this was the bulla ethmoralis. We followed this is the OMC bulla ethmoralis. We followed the bulla ethmoralis from here. This is the bulla ethmoralis. This is a bulla ethmoralis. This is the uh, infundibulum. This is the uh, hiatus terminalis inferioris. This is a bulla ethmoralis. We follow the bulla ethmoralis. This is a bulla ethmoralis. That is the anterior ethmoids. This is the anterior ethmoids bulla ethmoralis. Now, we all know that uh, when we open the frontal sinus, we use the intact bulla technique to preserve the anterior ethmoidal artery. So, the bulla ethmoralis acts as a bodyguard to the anterior ethmoidal artery see this is the artery this is the artery immediately you go anterior you see bulla see this a big pneumatized structure you see this bulla see this this is bulla this is the inferior turbinate there is no uncinate now because we have entered the posterior region middle turbinate this is the bulla ethmoralis a huge cell see that huge cell this is all bulla ethmoralis this is bulla ethmoralis. So immediately behind when the bulla ends. Now this is the anterior ethmoidal cell. Now immediately behind the bulla ethmoralis is the anterior ethmoidal artery. See the level. See the level. You cannot see the artery over here because it is just posterior to this. And see the bulla is attached right up till here. This is the skull base level. This is right up till here it is attached. This is a bulla ethmoralis. So immediately 0.6 mm you go behind see that's the artery see that's the artery see that's the proper artery where was it immediately behind the bulla this is the bulla immediately behind the bulla was the artery immediately so these are the three landmarks where you can understand the anatomy of the anterior ethmoidal artery be it on a ct scan or be it in trop while doing a surgery these three landmarks will give you the proper location of the anterior ethmoidal artery. And you can see it is almost almost at the level at the skull base. This is the level of skull base. This is the level of skull base. It is in at the level of skull base. So this is at the level of skull base. Few millimeters below you can see. So this is a curviform plate. This is a lateral lamella. So the skull base, this is Kiros type 2. So the skull base becomes a bit higher up. So this is few millimeters distance between them. Otherwise, uh, normally it should run in the skull base. So this is a few mm below. So with the help of the orbital anatomy, we get to know the level of the AEA. 
with the help of these three stationary landmarks out of which the ground lamella is the most consistent that is the ethmoidal bulla that is the intact bulla the ground lamella and the supraorbital recess these three and the orbital is four so there are four points on the basis of which you can read the anatomy of the anterior ethmoidal artery now the course of the anterior ethmoidal artery now as i said the anterior ethmoidal artery is a branch of the ophthalmic artery which in turn is a branch of the internal carotid artery now once in the orbit when it is given off by the ophthalmic artery near the medial margin a bit towards the posterior aspect and the medial margin of the orbit it runs in a intraorbital canal along with the nasociliary nerve now remember it is along with the nasociliary nerve in the orbital part the moment it comes near the medial rectus and the superior oblique it forms a nipple candidate nipple sign it exits into the orbitocranial canal that is a canal joining the orbit and the cranium so orbitocranial canal so it is orbitocranial canal this is a canal you can see here it is this is the canal so first part is intraorbital second part is intracanalicular then as soon as see this i'll show you in much more clarity see this that's the canal you can see and where is it piercing the lateral lamella as i told you this is a medial lamella this is a vertical lateral lamella it is piercing the lateral lamella and entering into the brain now this is a midline there is fox cerebri as we all know the fox cerebri lies here dividing the two frontal lobes the this is fox cerebri so this is the artery leaving from the canal entering into the cranial cavity here now the moment it enters or pierces through the lateral lamella it gives off a branch into the uh, anterior aspect of the skull base into the meningeal layer the brain that is called as uh, it is called as the anterior falcine artery also called as the anterior meningeal artery also called as the anterior fox artery these all are the uh, different names of same artery branch which supplies the fox cerebri this supplies the fox cerebri and uh, the place at which the lateral lamella is pierced by the anterior ethmoidal artery you can clearly see the canal this is a canal the nipple sign the canal entering into the lateral lamella that particular area is the weakest area or the thinnest area in the entire skull base of the region so once it enters the intracranial cavity after piercing the lateral lamella it gives off a anterior falcine branch anterior meningeal branch anterior fox branch all different names for same artery then it goes into the nose so first was what first was intraorbital along with the nasociliary nerve the moment it runs into the orbitocranial canal that is we see during the surgery in the nose that canal is called as the orbitocranial canal it runs along with the anterior ethmoidal nerve now the anterior ethmoidal nerve is a continuation of the nasociliary nerve enters the brain gives off a fox cerebri branch enters into the nose so intraorbital intracanalicular intracranial then again extracranial which is the intranasal where it supplies the uh, where it supplies the ethmoid sinuses the frontal sinus the lateral wall of the nose the septum so four structures i repeat in the nose it supplies lateral wall septum uh, frontal sinus uh, ethmoid sinus and then back again runs extracranially again uh, to run between the dorsum of the nose to supply the region outside dorsum of the nose so this is the five divisions of the anterior ethmoidal artery intraorbital intracanalicular intracranial intranasal extranasal dorsal in, uh, under the dorsum of the nose so five parts so five parts of the anterior ethmoidal artery course you should be well versed with so yeah so the the canal here you can see it has anterior ethmoidal artery anterior ethmoidal nerve and the anterior ethmoidal vein 
so if during surgery accidentally you uh, injure the medial aspect so if during surgery accidentally injure the medial aspect you cause the artery to retract into the orbit see this is the arterial canal if you injure it towards the uh, lateral aspect towards the orbital side the artery will get dissected it will retract inside the orbit in the orbit as all sides are bony it cannot expand max to max volume is 30 ml beyond that it cannot expand so within a duration of 10 to 15 minutes if the blood vessel retracts it will cause intraorbital bleeding and cause a hematoma and directly you see this what is this this is the optic nerve this is the optic nerve what will happen if the artery retracts inside and all is this bleeding and this is all bony it will not expand the optic nerve here will get compressed and what will happen within 10 to 15 minutes there will be complete blindness to the patient when he wakes up from the anesthesia and you will have a huge globular swelling outside during surgery so this is the importance of the anterior ethmoidal artery over here and if you injure it to the medial aspect definitely this is the weakest point it will cause a CSF leak and a meningeal prolapse depending on the injury caused so I think this was the gist of the anterior ethmoidal artery I just gave you so I hope the concepts are very clear right now about the anterior ethmoidal artery uh, the diameter of the anterior ethmoidal artery is 0.8 to 0.9 mm it runs slightly posterior lateral to anterior medial course uh, it has a see this uh, if you view this very scan superiorly so that your orbit is below you uh, the anterior ethmoidal artery leaves the canal in relation to the lamina papyracea at an angle of 60 degrees the range is from 20 degrees to 80 degrees but more commonly it is 60 degrees the angle made is 60 degrees with a posterior lateral to anterior medial course like this see this I am drawing a line like this so it's like this it's 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 like curving up to enter into the lamina papyracea up now from the lamina into the skull base so it's like uh, this it goes like this okay so this was the uh, thing about the anterior ethmoidal artery in detail so next i would like to focus on how to differentiate between the anterior ethmoids and the posterior ethmoids i told you before only the, the ground lamella is the one which separates the two that is the anterior ethmoids and the posterior ethmoids is divided by the ground lamella we could see the ground lamella right here and directly this is a posterior ethmoids now uh, there are a lot of changes once you enter the posterior ethmoids i would like to bring your attention to that so we are now in the posterior ethmoids so the changes occurring are once you are in the anterior ethmoids the orbit you see see the orbit you are in the anterior ethmoids the orbit is properly spherical it is circular the orbit is spherical see the orbit is spherical this is a spherical orbit so this was the ground lamella see this was a ground lamella here so this is a posterior see this is still circular i will say this is still circular the level of the artery so the anterior ethmoidal artery lies immediately anterior to the ground lamella so it is the uh, it is the artery which is present in the most posterior aspect of the anterior ethmoids remember that so now this scan is of the posterior ethmoids see immediately the moment you leave from the anterior ethmoids to the posterior ethmoids see the change in the orbit it is becoming conical now it was circular here a moment ago and the moment you enter the posterior ethmoids immediately it becomes conical see it becomes conical follow me see it becomes conical this is conical this is entirely conical and look at the size look at the size this is huge anterior 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 now posterior starts becomes conical becomes conical and keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and until and unless it reaches the orbital apex this is the orbital apex so this is this is the uh, sphenoid sinus and this is the orbital apex 
this is the orbital apex looks like some kind of connection here this could be the superior orbital fissure okay so yeah that was it so that was the first change please mark my words that was the first change uh, for of the orbit from the anterior to the posterior ethmoids so the second change is look at the maxilla see we are in the anterior ethmoids anterior ethmoids the maxillary size keeps on increasing and it is triangular in shape see this is the level of the ground lamella see now exactly the moment you enter the posterior ethmoids here this is a posterior ethmoids here see the shape of the maxilla it becomes oval it was triangular up till now see it was triangular up till now triangular 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 the moment you hear see it becomes starts becoming oval now right see this is oval it is purely oval shaped and then becomes tapered and narrowed off and then disappears see totally disappears gone so that was the second change first change was the orbit size and shape second change was the maxillary size and shape now what could be the third thing third thing would be the number and the size of the anterior and the posterior ethmoidal cells now this was the anterior ethmoids anterior ethmoid see anterior ethmoids are small and multiple okay they are small and multiple you can see small and multiple cells in the anterior ethmoids this is the anterior ethmoids anterior the moment you go in the posterior ethmoids the moment you go in the posterior ethmoids look at them see the cell size now i'll give you this and this see the cell size is so small and multiple see the cell size is huge and the number is less so in the anterior ethmoids the cell size is small but their number is plenty in the posterior ethmoids the number is small and the size is big see that the size is big clearly see this one cell is so big and this is two cells max to max two cells this is one this is two only two cells huge cells posterior ethmoids here i can count 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 10 these are small but multiple these are huge but uh, low in number so that's the third change you see what is the fourth change now please note the first was the orbital shape change second was the maxillary shape change third one was a uh, anterior ethmoid posterior ethmoid cell and numbers uh, okay so these were the three changes now what is the fourth change you ask now the fourth change see this once you are in the anterior ethmoids see this anterior ethmoid area this is the anterior ethmoids anterior ethmoids see it is kind of slopy nature see the skull base it's kind of sloping it is sloping see it is having a slope towards the center it's having a slope and it is thin in nature the anterior skull base is slopy and having thin structure the moment this is the ground lamella the moment you go behind see it keep a, it becomes flat see it becomes flat see here this is sloping like this like this eyebrow shaped this is sloping like this and look at this this is almost what horizontal almost horizontal see this almost flat 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 and how was this sloping see sloping and how is this flat this is the fourth change and what is the fifth change the thickness this is thin anterior ethmoidal skull base is thin so this is a posterior it becomes thicker now see the integrity it becomes thick it keeps on getting thick and flat thick and flat see this the thickness see the thickness it becomes thick and flat this is all thick and flat so five differences where you see so there are five differences where you see anterior to posterior transition so if at all if any one single picture is given to you like this if i give this only single picture to you how will you identify whether this is anterior at merge or posterior at merge by the shape of the maxilla look at it oval so it is posterior look at the size and cell number huge cell size and less number what is it posterior at merge look at the orbit so conical and so small so compressed see it is posterior see the skull base so thick so flat 
all five points together in one picture shortcut this is a posterior ethmoid so never ever in your entire life you can ever go wrong never you can never go wrong you can blindly read your ct scan in your wildest dreams if your basics are clear so this was the difference between the anterior ethmoids and the posterior ethmoids now see taking attention to yet another important structure which is the spinopalatine foramen the spinopalatine foramen now see the spinopalatine foramen the, the keep on going posterior posterior keep on going posterior keep on going posterior keep on going posterior keep on going posterior see this what is this area this is a maxilla the posterior most end of the maxilla becoming oval and narrowed off this is the middle turbinate attached to the perpendicular plate of the palatine this is the inferior turbinate uh, what is this this is the posterior most end of the posterior ethmoidal cell this is not yet sphenoid i will teach you in detail when the sphenoid starts and when the posterior ethmoid stops so many of the young surgeons will think that this is a sphenoid but no this is never sphenoid i will i am so sure that this, this is the posterior most ethmoidal group of cells and behind this will be the sphenoid for sure yeah that's the sphenoid i'll tell you how in detail don't worry so i was talking about the spinopalatine foramen yep yeah. see this is the entry of the spinopalatine foramen just keep on following the maxilla the easy trick on the ct scan to identify is to keep on following the maxilla this is a maxillary sinus keep on following it right up to the posterior end you will see at the superior level superior medial level at the level of the middle turbinate insertion okay at the level of the middle turbinate insertion there you will you see a canal like structure here see this now no, this is way too posterior this is a pup this is a telegopalatine fossa this you see this i'll give you a close up view you see this this is the maxilla this is a middle turbinate this is a inferior turbinate see this canal going in between the two see this canal see this gap narrow gap see this narrow gap see this narrow gap see that is what that is your spinopalatine foramen that is your spinopalatine foramen through which the spinopalatine artery the, the nasopalatine nerve comes okay so this is the uh, spinopalatine foramen now if you go behind go behind that is the pterygopalatine fossa pterygopalatine fossa pterygopalatine fossa i will still repeat this is the region this is the region of the pterygopalatine fossa this was the region of the spinopalatine foramen this is the pterygopalatine fossa here this is pterygopalatine fossa this is the infratemporal fossa this is a temporal bone this is the posterior most part this is actually a sphenoid bone the frontal sphenoid bone this is a lateral temporal this is the infratemporal fossa yeah so this is the pterygopalatine fossa ppf p p f pterygopalatine fossa this is a pterygopalatine fossa this is the infratemporal fossa together connected by the pterygomaxillary fissure okay and what is this structure going up here see this narrow air see this this is what this is here this is the spinopalatine foramen this is this is what is this this is spinopalatine foramen go thoda posteriorly you see this pterygopalatine for a fossa pterygopalatine fossa and this is the infratemporal fossa and what is this area what is this area what is this simple logic this is this is the orbit this is the orbit so this is the orbit and this is the inferior what is this inferior orbital fissure this is the orbit this is the inferior orbital fissure orbit inferior orbital fissure as it is inferiorly opening this is the orbit so it is inferior orbital fissure inferior orbital fissure not the superior never consider this as superior orbital fissure superior orbital fissure i'll show you it comes way ahead way posteriorly towards the sphenoid sinus this is the entry of the sphenoid sinus most anterior aspect 
and this is the orbital apex that is this is the orbit this is the orbit the orbit ends here see there is no orbit here this is the apex area yeah this is the apex now there is no orbit here this is the orbital apex basically this should be the orbital apex with all the muscles and all this is the orbital apex so in cases of patients having the orbital apex syndrome this is the area where you have to operate if at all there is a compression you can access the sphenoid sinus go way laterally expose the lateral the uh, either drill the bone or remove the bone with a fresh elevator pull it up and then you can release the area here so this is the orbital apex and the patients with orbital apex syndrome can be treated with this case here so this is the orbital apex this is the orbital apex orbital apex orbital apex keep on going posteriorly follow the orbital apex follow the orbital apex follow the orbital apex what where do you end up this is the cavernous sinus cavernous sinus cavernous sinus uh, what is orbital apex orbital apex behind that is what superior orbital fissure what is this see this opening this area is the superior orbital fissure that's the area of the superior orbital fissure see if you follow the anatomy follow the concepts everything is easy for you what is this this is the orbital apex what is this this is the orbital apex orbital apex this is what this is orbital apex this is the area of cavernous sinus if i keep on going posteriorly what is this this is the cavernous sinus this is the cavernous sinus if i do an mri and compare this area on the mri this will be the cavernous sinus this is the cavernous sinus cavernous sinus so what is cavernous sinus cavernous sinus is what is superior orbital fissure superior orbital fissure is nothing but the continuation anterior continuation of the cavernous sinus now if you ever uh, read about the anatomy of the 6th uh, cranial nerve that is the abducens cranial nerve that it passes through the dorsolus canal then it ca enters into the uh, cavernous sinus and then into the orbit through the superior orbital fissure cavernous sinus anteriorly extends as what uh superior orbital fissure yeah so what you have here this is the orbital apex here this opening you see here this is a superior orbital fissure you keep on going behind keep on going behind this is a superior orbital fissure this is a cavernous sinus keep on going behind this is cavernous sinus proper this is cavernous sinus this is cavernous sinus so this is how you should follow the anatomy this is sphenoid so i was showing you the sphenopalatine foramen this is the area of the sphenopalatine foramen this is a canal this is the sphenopalatine foramen and uh, this is the uh, sphenopalatine foramen this is a ppf and uh, this is a ppf and this is the uh infratemporal fossa so that's the sphenopalatine foramen that's the pterygopalatine fossa that's the infratemporal fossa that's the inferior orbital fissure that's the orbital apex that's the most anterior aspect of the sphenoid sinus inferior orbital fissure pterygopalatine fossa infratemporal fossa you go keep on going posteriorly you keep on going posteriorly this is the most posterior aspect of the pterygoparapna orbital apex this is a sphenoid sinus proper and this is the cavernous sinus area so this is the area where the young surgeons get really confused as to where the cavernous sinus starts where the superior orbital fissure starts and uh, where is the uh, inferior orbital the ppf and the itf so i hope the basics are all clear right now so coming on to the most important thing see as you go posteriorly posteriorly now there's one more question which arises how do you identify that this is the posterior most ethmoid and not the sphenoid like here now see follow the posterior ethmoids now this was the start of the posterior ethmoids uh, as we saw this was the attachment of the middle turbinate to the perpendicular plate of the palatine so this is the start of the posterior ethmoids so this is the posterior ethmoids okay see look at this 
terion to terion completely attached completely attached see terion to terion completely attached follow it see there is complete attachment of the bone complete attachment of the bone see complete attachment complete attachment now what what bone is this this is a frontal bone orbital plate of the frontal bone frontal bone this is frontal bone frontal bone orbital plate keep on going posteriorly keep on going now see this the continue the continuation is not there anymore see this there is a huge defect i cannot say defect but there is a huge area where there is no bone as we all saw this is a posterior ethmoid continuous see continuously there was a bony plate all throughout there was a bony plate all throughout so here also there is a bony plate all throughout see here there is no bony plate now what is this this scan now this is a second last scan second last row this scan this entire structure i'm showing you this entire structure belongs to the sphenoid bone okay this entire structure belongs to the sphenoid bone this is the lesser wing of sphenoid this is the lesser wing of sphenoid this is the greater wing of sphenoid as you keep on going posteriorly lesser wing this is the greater wing of sphenoid as you can see the greater wing of sphenoid lesser wing of sphenoid so basically you should know the anatomy of the sphenoid bone in detail for the residents it comes as a long question in the theory exams as well uh, for the final year exams so this is the lesser wing this is the greater wing this is the pterygoid this is a pterygoid body pterygoid body this is a medial pterygoid plate lateral pterygoid plate this is the coena this is the coena and this is a sphenoid proper now the first point to identify whether this is sphenoid or not as i just said look for the uh, continuation in the bone the area where the, there is this continuation that area is the beginning of the uh, sphenoid bone anatomy this is a lesser wing of sphenoid so this is the sphenoid proper and this is the posterior most ethmoid cell posterior most posterior ethmoid cell and uh, as i said earlier this is a tilted ct scan so the left side is appearing first so this is the most anterior aspect of the sphenoid here on the left side and this is the most posterior aspect of the posterior ethmoid cell on the right side so see here the bone is intact so this is a posterior ethmoid and here the bone is not there so this is a lesser wing of sphenoid in view so this is the sphenoid bone so sphenoid sinus so in one scan itself being a tilted image you can see the sphenoid first and here the posterior most posterior ethmoid so this is both sphenoid proper so that was the first technique of identifying the sphenoid from the posterior ethmoid the second uh, the most common technique is to follow the septum keep on following the septum now see this was the ground lamellar level this is a posterior ethmoid see the septum see the septum here attached to the skull base see it is a single continuous structure it is a single bony continuous structure see here it is a single bony continuous structure similarly it is a single continuous bony structure keep on following see now this is the area this is also a continuous single bony structure now prior to it now this is prior to it you see this is the thickening of the this is a thickening of the area of the septum see the septum so thin in this region see this transition see this septum and see this sudden thickening of the septum in the between see in the middle there is sudden thickening see this this is a septum and see this thickening here this is a rostrum of sphenoid being a tilted image it is not very clear in a particular level this is elevated this is not so it is hard to uh, identify but still this is the rostrum of sphenoid this is the rostrum of sphenoid 
see the thickness it is having here this is a rostrum of sphenoid we go follow it see this is a septum now this is a septum now and this is a sphenoid on the left side proper with numerous intra sphenoidal septa giving it a collection and uh, this is a lesser wing excess pneumatization so yeah so to say the first point was to identify the sphenoid from the posterior ethmoids uh, with the help of uh, the uh, presence of the bony continuity that is the start of the lesser wing the moment there is a discontinuity like this we could see this is the beginning of the uh, lesser wing of sphenoid so this is a lesser wing of sphenoid and this is sphenoid proper second technique was to see the septum keep on following it see the septum here keep on following that same septum it has become thick here see this is called as a rostrum of sphenoid and the third point along with it is see this is a nasal cavity proper this is a nasal cavity this is still the posterior ethmoid here this is a nasal cavity as soon as you go in a uh, one scan behind 0.6 mm you see this this is the nasal cavity here at this level and this is called as coena this is a coena while well, this was a nasal cavity posterior most nasal cavity and this is a coena now and this is a sphenoid sinus proper and this is coena and see the septum it's only till here at the level of coena above it is the intersphenoidal septa on this side now so these are two to three changes which happens to identify between the sphenoid and the posterior ethmoids so at various levels at different scans various levels of the anterior ethmoid posterior ethmoids the uh, orbit maxilla various levels sphenoid from posterior posterior from ethmoid anterior ethmoids at all these different levels there is there is there is at least three to four points of differentiation at all the levels where you can differentiate all the different cells with each other so if you know all this if your concepts are clear about all this no way ever you are going to go wrong even the most complicated case you will be able to identify and differentiate so as i was saying in this scan right now uh in this scan this entire scan is of sphenoid bone as i said lesser wing this is greater wing this is the sphenoid sinus proper this is the area of the pterygoid body that is also called as a pterygoid wedge in the center but there has been a excess lateral pneumonization so this pneumatized see this is a greater wing of sphenoid see this is a greater wing of sphenoid this is a greater wing of sphenoid the area here was the area of the pterygoid wedge or the pterygoid body this is the area of the pterygoid wedge or the pterygoid body and this is the area of the greater wing of sphenoid now this is called as lateral recess of sphenoid lateral recess is nothing but the excess pneumatization of the sphenoid itself into the pterygoid body or the greater wing of sphenoid so both either the greater wing of sphenoid or the pterygoid or both is a lateral recess in this case on the right side you can see both uh, pneumatization in the pterygoid pneumatization in the greater wing of sphenoid and pneumatization in the pterygoid body see and immediately below this pterygoid wedge or the pterygoid body here is the medial pterygoid plate lateral pterygoid plate and this is the area of the pterygoid muscles pterygoid muscles so this is the inferior turbinate this is this is the inferior turbinate this is the coena this is the midline septum this is the intraspinoidal septae and this is the interspinoidal septum okay so this is basic the anatomy of the sphenoid as you go posteriorly the same structure as you can see this is a lateral recess of the greater wing and the pterygoid body the medial pterygoid lateral pterygoid plates now i want you to know something the medial pterygoid when you do a zero degree first pass in your scopies in your opds and or surgeries when you see coena or in case of coenal atresia see the coena lateral boundary is formed by the medial pterygoid plate see how close the relation is this is immediately the medial pterygoid plate becomes the lateral coena boundary so this is nothing but the medial pterygoid plate we feel that is the medial pterygoid plate so immediately above that is the pterygoid wedge 
so this is a pterygoid wedge or the pterygoid body which has been pneumatized here so this is the area of the origin of the juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma so until and unless you drill the bone remove the jna coming from the origin that is a pterygoid wedge itself the jna will keep on recurring lifelong or at least at a particular amount uh, particular specific age you have to drill the bone and remove that you have to drill the bone and remove that so you keep on going anteriorly uh, sorry you keep on going posteriorly uh, you see the same structures coming now uh, as i said this was the area of the cavernous sinus follow keep following the orbital apex you end up into the superior orbital fissure and go directly posterior of the superior orbital fissure is nothing but the cavernous sinus this is the cavernous sinus if you do a mri contrast exactly at this level you will see a cavernous sinus and uh, i will show you this area uh, what is this this is uh, this what is this this is the area of the anterior clinoid process these two structures the anterior clinoid process the anterior clinoid process here are well pneumatized actually that is why they appearing as black otherwise they appear as pure white ivory white so this is the this is the anterior clinoid process which is pneumatized this bulge you see here this bulge you see here yeah the c shaped bulge this bulge here yeah this bulge and uh, this bulge these two bulges this bulge is of internal carotid artery and which part of the internal carotid artery so that's the cavernous part of the internal carotid artery you see this bulge i was talking about this is the cavernous part as i said this is a cavernous sinus and this is a bulge you can see over here this bulge is actually the bulge of the cavernous sinus uh, internal carotid artery so as i was saying uh, this is the bulge of the internal carotid artery and here you can see the optic nerve this is a bulge of the optic nerve now usually the optic nerve is just medial to the clinoid process the anterior clinoid process normally the anterior clinoid process is here and the optic nerve is just medial to the uh, anterior clinoid process but in this case it seems to be as if uh, the optic nerve on the left side is running in a canal which is well within the sphenoid sinus this is well within the sphenoid sinus this is a very this is a very rare case where not that rare but it is very uncommon for the optic nerve to be completely running in a separate canal over here and that too in the sphenoid sinus totally within the sphenoid sinus so this uh, a surgeon called as delano had given the classification known as a delano grading the delano d e l a n o delano delano classification in which he has stated four groups of the optic nerve in relation to the sphenoid sinus pneumatization so uh, so yeah this is the optic nerve it has to be the optic nerve and this is the ica this optic nerve is well within the sphenoid sinus and running in a canal entirely in the sphenoid sinus as you go posteriorly you see this this is the area of the ica this is the area of the optic nerve bulge this is the ica area this is the area of the internal carotid artery this is the area of the internal carotid artery and this is the area of the optic nerve see the optic nerve bulge is still well within the sphenoid sinus so delano gave four groups of classification the four types of optic nerve relation to sphenoid sinus pneumatization it is type 1 2 3 and 4 in roman numericals so in type 1 it is uh, the optic nerve doesn't have any indentation on the sphenoid wall type 2 is that the optic nerve has slight indentation on the sphenoid wall where you can appreciate through the sphenoid sinus the optic nerve bulge type 3 is what you can see in the front is that it runs as a separate canal well within the sphenoid sinus and type 4 is it runs in a well defined canal through the sphenoid sinus and the posterior ethmoids so that is a severe most pneumatization of the sphenoid of the optic nerve so according to the classification this could be delano type 3 classification uh, the most important finding here i'll tell you this is the onodi cell 
this is the only cell you see this is the interspinoidal septa like this interspinoidal septa okay so this is the interspinoidal septa like this um, this could be a odory cell this is a very weird pattern of pneumatization but this cell could be a odory cell in which the optic nerve on the opposite side is running into the cell called as onary cell and this is the internal carotid artery bulge so the internal carotid artery bulge is in the right sinus proper and the optic nerve is bulging into the onary cell so what is onary cell onary cell is a posterior ethmoidal cell which pneumatizes uh, is the posterior most ethmoidal cell which pneumatizes and uh, lies posterior superior and lateral to the sphenoid sinus proper so this is the sphenoid sinus proper it lies superior a bit posterior and towards lateral more towards posterior superior in which case if it is present the optic nerve passes or you can say the optic nerve has a bulge through that onary cell so instead of having a bulge in the main sinus proper it has a bulge on the onary because the onary cell pushes the sphenoid sinus proper away from its normal position so that the optic nerve opens up into the onary cell so if you do not see the scan and you inadvertently enter into the sphenoid sinus not knowing where you are exactly going you might just directly hit the optic nerve because this optic nerve on both sides is in the sinus proper cavity so if you hit the optic nerve the patient will definitely land up in blindness post-op so it's just that keep on following following you just keep on following this is the sinus proper a lot of intra sinus septa you can see now the area of the anterior clinoid process exactly at this level so this is the area of the anterior clinoid process so if you take this axis exactly below at the level posteriorly if you go you can see the posterior clinoid process so you can see the posterior clinoid process see this area see this bulge that's the posterior clinoid process that's the that's the area of the posterior clinoid process not well limitized but yeah that's the area of the posterior clinoid process so if you go if you go you see this defect over here See, just follow the skull base, just follow the skull base, this entire thing is of sphenoid, sphenoid, see this, the entire uh, greater wing is intact, greater wing is intact, keep on following the greater wing of sphenoid, eventually you will have an area of defect, you see that instrument of mine, that much of defect you can see, and well, you see, you can see that defect over here that is not a defect but actually that is the foramen oval that is foramen ovale so foramen ovale which transmits the mandibular nerve that is the v that is the mandibular nerve which is v3 so v3 which is a mandibular nerve v3 that is a trigeminal nerve third branch mandibular nerve v3 passes through foramen ovale which is here in the greater wing of sphenoid so if you come anteriorly now in this case I'm trying to visualize the Vidian canal and the uh, the foramen rotundum but in this case it is not that visible. What I can see here you can see what I can, because of the excess pneumatization and the presence of the lateral recess normally had if if the lateral recess was not here okay had the uh, pterygoid body been normally over here had the pterygoid body be normal over here the vidian canal at the base of the floor of the sphenoid see this would have been the floor of sphenoid had this pterygoid body been normal this would have been the floor of sphenoid so at the floor of sphenoid in the pterygoid body itself the inferior medially there should be the vidian canal where i'm pointing right now so what i'm showing you right now here is the vidian canal you see this area over here see this bulge over here that's the area of the vidian canal and here it should be so inferior medial in your vidian, uh, vidian canal and uh, superior lateral over this region at the base of the sphenoid 
in the pterygoid body itself should be the V2 that is a foramen rotundum the maxillary nerve so this and this so this is inferior medial median canal and this is the superior lateral V2 foramen rotundum because of the excess lateral recess pneumatization they are getting away from each other so if in normal case they will be very close to each other but if in case of any pneumatization they get away from each other so this is a median canal over here on the left side as well okay yeah that sums it up this is a nasopharynx this is a nasopharynx see coronal section nasopharynx this is a nasopharynx here you can see see what is this this is the ischic and tube opening i told you this is a medial pterygoid plate forming the coena just go behind the coena what is there ischic and tube you see this is the ischic and tube opening that's the ischic and tube and what is this bulge over here this is torus tubaris and what is this this is fossa of rosen muller deeply you follow the fossa of rosen muller laterally you enter into the parapharyngeal part of the internal carotid artery where if you want to operate it in skull based surgeries you can have access through the foramen uh, of fossa of rosen muller you drill the medial pterygoid plate access the parapharyngeal uh, carotid artery access the parapharyngeal carotid artery keep on following it so see here in this picture it's more prominent this is ischic and tube opening this is torus tuberus this is a fossa of rosen muller area this is the area of the adenoids you keep on going posteriorly you see the entire structures visualize it uh, this is a foramen ovale as i said mandibular nerve and everything that's the sphenoid most posterior aspect sphenoid so that's the uh, mastoid region now starting the temp the temporal bone petrous part this is the mastoid region pneumatization starting now and this is a temporal mandibular mostly yeah so basically we have covered all the anatomy in the ct scan pns so so start right from the start film right from the first film to the end of this last film we have covered all the cells all the anatomy how to differentiate different anatomy from which cells so i hope you uh, find this video kind of helpful for your future ct scan reference and uh, thank you for watching keep subscribing keep learning thank you